All right, we'll go ahead and kick it off now. Can you hear me okay? I got you, Lima Charlie. Okay, all right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Breaking the Chain with Jeremy Walters and our special guest tonight, Rod Machado. My name is Paul Nadeau, and I'll be your technical person for the webinar tonight. Kind of like a virtual flight attendant, but without soft drinks and pretzels. No peanuts either. Anyhow, tonight's presentation is a Zoom webinar. For those of you that have not, never been on a Zoom webinar before, on the bottom of your screen, you're gonna have a couple of different uh, options for you down there. One of them is gonna be a chat feature, which is gonna be used for any kind of chat that you wanna just you know, say hi from wherever or, or, or just general chat. If you have something that you uh, have a specific question for Rod this evening, please put it over under the Q&A and we'll be more than happy to go ahead and, and get those questions up to Rod to get them answered. Um, if you have any technical problems or issues, you have a raise hand option on there. If you raise your hand, I'll go ahead and instant message you directly uh, to see if we can't fix the problem that we have. So please keep your electronics on and available this evening. Sit back and enjoy the webinar. Jeremy, over to you. All right, we'll start at 7.30 flat, okay. Texas time. And by the way, for everybody out there, <clears throat> Jeremy and I had a bet on how many people would be in the uh, webinar, and Jeremy now owes me a beer. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds good. And I show 730, so let's get this started. All right, broadcasting to viewers across the world, it's Tuesday night from the heart of Central Texas, and this is Breaking the Chain. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we're discussing defensive flying with guest speaker, Rod Machado. This is an FAA credited WINGS event. Now, as some of you may know, the objective of the WINGS program is to address the primary accident factors that continue to plague general aviation. By focusing on this objective, we hope to reduce the number of accidents we see each year for the same causes. It's not an awards program, but it's a true a proficiency program designed to help improve our skills and knowledge as pilots. If you're not already a WINGS participant, uh, please follow the link here. And if you have questions, send me an email. Also, my program manager at the San Antonio FISDO is Inspector Ryan Newman. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions on how we can improve this program, please feel free to write either he or I at the email addresses provided. Become part of the WINGS program and let's all do our part to become better pilots. All right, my name is Jeremy Walters and uh, that slide right there shows a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm a professional pilot, but more importantly to me, I'm a professional flight instructor. Uh, my aviation career began with a broom and a mop bucket as well as washing and fueling airplanes at a little airport in the middle of South Carolina. In the tall pines of St. George, South Carolina, I fell in love with aviation and worked my way through the ranks to CFI uh, through years of hard work and dedication and a lot of incredible mentorship from a lot of people that I really uh, cherish to, the, to this day. I found myself um, Thereafter 9-11, being in college and wanting to serve and give back, so I accepted an ROTC uh, commission after the completion of college. Uh, somehow managed to score a pilot slot uh, flying the H-64 Apache Longbow. So my, my road has been an interesting one, to say the least. Um, I started in a Challenger LSA aircraft. Uh, and flew the most techn technologically advanced helicopter in the world, which is the Apache. I've also flown jets, King Airs, uh, a lot of different stuff. And my true passion is giving back. And a lot of folks have asked me along the way, well, what is your ultimate goal? Well, I have a lot of goals, but my ultimate goal, goal has never been very clear to me until about last week when I had what I call an aha moment. And that aha moment was my go ultimate goal is to continue down this path and, as and help as many people as I can along the way. 
And that's what I intend to do with the time that I have left uh, in the hourglass of life. So that's who I am. I'm a lead fast team rep in the San Antonio FISDO. I could not do this without the support of a lot. Um, from Paul to all of the people in Central Texas to all of the flight instructors and mentors that I've had along the way, and especially to my wife and kids and Betsy Blue, who is right behind us. Here, not shown, is my fifth child, uh, little Jeremy. He's number five. He came to us last July, and he's growing just as fast as a mustard sprout. As I mentioned before, I'm assisted by this gentleman by the name of Paul Nadal, and Paul is awesome. He is my technical guru, and I consider him, for all of you, you military folks, almost like my principal advisor. Uh, he is a U.S. Navy veteran. He participates in angel flights, and uh, him and I talk daily on how we can make this program better and how we can extend our outreach to help uh, provide us uh, provide a service to the community. So that brings me to the question and the content of this particular webinar. What is breaking the chain? Well, we've all heard of the human factors error chain. And what that human factor error chain is, is a point at which we receive the uh, we, we see, receive the idea to go do a flight or go mow the grass, actually. It doesn't have to be flying related, but we apply it to flying. We get the idea to go fly, and then we find ourselves in an incident or an accident. What are we trying to do? We know that there are a lot of links of errors between the moment we get the idea to do something to a, something bad happening. So if we can remove one of the links of the chain, which is our goal, we prevent the incident or accident from happening and we make it to our destination like we want to. So with that being said, how do we break the chain? We break the chain by doing what we're doing tonight, by getting pilots together. So tonight, our guest speaker, has been in aviation for more than 50 years. Uh, Rod became hooked with the romance of aviation in a flight in a Telecraft L2 when he was 16. He's a teacher at heart, an airline transport pilot who would rather fly a 150 on a flyby than a Bonanza because it lasts longer, a dedicated flight instructor with over, over 10,000 hours of instruction given, a dedicated aviation author of seven books, renowned aviation public speaker, the voice of Microsoft Flight Simulator, a columnist in AOPA and Flying Magazines, and an endless list of accolades for his contributions and dedications as an edu aviation educator. Tonight, it is my very distinct honor to present our guest speaker, Mr. Rod Machado. Rod? You have the flight controls. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much. And thank you, Paul. I, I do appreciate that. And uh, uh, I used to work for AOPA as a columnist. I did that for about 20 years. And uh, I no longer am a columnist for them. I About four years ago, I decided to uh, stop writing and work on my own business, which was uh, neglected for so many years. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the last four years, as well as flying and having a lot of fun. Uh, my wife and I, we do own, we had a Bonanza and a P210 and we uh, sold those. Now we have a Cessna 150 Landomatic, which was, don't laugh if you were laughing, uh, because that's originally what the Cessna 150 was called. It was called a Landomatic. I think that was until the lawyers actually thought about the title and realized, you know, some people may take that seriously and uh, expect the airplane to Landomatize itself, <laughs> which it doesn't. So it's a real pleasure to be here with both of you folks. And uh, kudos to, uh, to both of you and Paul, you know, uh, and Jeremy, setting up a program like this, you know, and spending your time, volunteering your time and uh, collecting, uh, connecting and conveying uh, all the necessary knowledge to pull this off is, uh, 
is a is a, an amazing thing to do. You were very smart, Jeremy. You got yourself one of the best IT guys in the business. So uh, that list that's gold. Um, and I would recommend raising Paul's salary, or uh, if anything, lowering everybody else's salary so it looks like he's getting more. I think he would appreciate that. Well, I also um, have him on board for good looks too. If, of course, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, uh, and wise choice. So um, you know, again, um, and you made AOPA. By the way, as we just mentioned, yes. Dan Nam Namowitz gave you a wonderful write-up, and uh, you should be very proud of that. So you're doing, you're doing good work here, and uh, I'm impressed, and that's why I wanted to join and uh, contribute what little I can contribute here. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to doing that tonight. So for the folks uh, out there, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to talk to you. And I know uh, that my two friends here are from Texas, and my wife, by the way, is from Texas. And when I first met her, she kept using these funny phrases like fixing to. Uh, I don't know what that was fixing to. So she said, uh, one time I said, are, are you getting ready to, to, to go out? And she said, I'm fixing to. And I said, well, why don't you fix another one? That way you could be fixing three. And so uh, that's when I knew that uh, she was the one for me. Plus she flies. So uh, she's an extra traffic controller, by the way, uh, at Houston Center, at Houston Center. And uh, that's why you should listen to the conversation that uh, occurs around our house. <laughs> Honey, are you ready to go? She said, stand by your number one for the callback. Can I get an ETA? She said, proceed to the penalty box uh, clearance on request. I mean, that's the way it goes all the time here. So, you know, it's fun being at the Machado household. We have a bet. in or out of the airplane. So uh, let's begin with tonight. First of all, uh, tonight you're going to hear things that you do not normally hear for a webinar in this price range. Mm -hmm. Now, since nobody's paying anything for this uh, and everybody's contributing, uh, this is a good deal. And I hope it's a good deal because I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've learned over the years that I think are the essential qualities of what makes someone safe in an airplane. Look, if you're like me, and I know I, know I am, take some time on that, um, it's I don't want to get hurt in an airplane. I want flying is one of my fun things, and I want to have as much fun as I can when I fly. And I want to make sure I don't get hurt and I don't hurt other people while I'm doing it. <clears throat> this is something I've been thinking about for many, many years. It's something that just you know stuck in my mind for uh, such a long time as a young flight instructor, and then it's the the basis, uh, the fodder, the foundation of of the many programs I've done all over the United States and Europe on aviation safety. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of philosophy tonight, and then I'll give you some practical tools that you can use uh, to hopefully apply to the cockpit. And it really, it, it's quite interesting. Of course, when I say philosophy, everybody immediately pays attention because somebody said philosophy. And, and, and rightly so, because you mentioned the word philosophy, it's like mentioning the word poetry. Everybody thinks, treat it like a hotel fire. Get low, get down, get out. But this is good philosophy. I don't mean strange philosophy, like if there are tires in the ocean, why are there no fish on the freeway? I'm talking about the philosophy of the, uh, the ability to be able to fly safely, for a long period of time and the ideas that uh, are required to be able to do that. First of all, I believe this, that you can be as safe as you wanna be in an airplane. And I make that as a declarative statement of fact, because fate is not the hunter, with no disrespect to Ernie Gann in his great book, Fate is the Hunter, <clears throat> because in, in a sense, flying is different than driving a car, because when you're driving a car, you don't really have control over the statistic of the other person in the uh, other lane coming at you at 50 miles per hour, you don't have control over that person. I mean, they, they may have a poorly maintained automobile and maybe they put some tires on their car that are made by the Maypop company. And if one of those tires go, that car comes into your lane and there are very few airbags powerful enough to uh, keep you safe in a collision at 100 accumulative miles per hour. So in an airplane, that's not the case because in an airplane, you have tremendous control over the statistic. Now, of course, if one doesn't control the statistic, then uh, the, the, the deal is that aviation can be very unforgiving here. But I'd much rather be in an airplane than in an automobile any day, as long as, as long as, and here's the caveat, as long as the weather's good, I have enough fuel in the tank, and I don't have to be at my destination, absolutely. Those are three individual criterion for the criteria of why I would rather be in an airplane than a car 
almost any time. And that's a statement of fact. And that's what I believe. Think about it. When you walk out on the road, if you walk out into a busy street and you get hit by a car, here's what I believe. I don't believe that you needed to get hit by a car on some sort of, let's say, karmic level, or that you wanted to get hit by a car on some sort of Freudian level. What I believe is that you walked out in the street when you should have been there because the risk was extremely high and you got hit by a car. You were in charge of whether you got hurt or not. It's the exact same thing in an airplane. So my question is this to you, and I want you to think now, again, thinking is sometimes a little difficult. Professor Mortimer Adler at the Philosophic Institute in New Jersey once said that 3% of the people think, 3% of the people think they think, and 94% of the people would rather die than think. So I want you to think about this by asking questions. And that's essentially how we think, right? We think by asking ourselves questions. My question to you is this, why have so many people been able to fly for so long and not get hurt in an airplane? Have you ever thought about that? It's an interesting question to ask because people fly for long periods of time, 50 years, and they don't get hurt. I've never gotten hurt in an airplane. I've been scared a few times, you know, I'm bought by some really scary things like a, a runaway Hobbs meter. That's pretty scary. Uh, but there are other things that have scared me, of course. I seen in the airplane and, you know, almost everything that has scared me in an airplane was something I had direct control over or indirect control over. And that, that's such a powerful thought. The answer to the question, why have so many people been able to fly for so long without getting hurt in an airplane is this, it's not luck. Because luck is one of those um, expressions that we have for probability that we just can't classify, that we can't quantify or qualify. In other words, a person is lucky and for, for some reason we can't put that into a nice tidy package so we say he got lucky. But in reality, if somebody can fly over a 50 year period, and if so many people, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people over, over decades and decades of time, that must mean that luck is not the thing that's responsible for their safety. What is responsible for their safety are the, uh, well, are all the little things they do to keep them safe or the few big things they do to keep them safe, which of course just happens to be the, uh, topic that uh, we're discussing tonight. So in that sense, you know, you think, okay, what, and, and you have a perfect right to, to question that comment, my, my comment about it's not luck that keeps you safe. It's doing the right thing that keeps you safe. Some people will say, wait a minute, what happens when an airplane has an engine failure? You know, hey, hey, that's not safe. Okay, granted. No, no, I, I give you that. Occasionally, an airplane will have an engine failure. <laughs> and most of the time when the engine quits, it's not because of catastrophic engine failure. It is because, would you care to take a guess at why an engine would quit? Hmm. Let's see, they didn't put any gas in the tank, or they ran out of the gas that they had in the tank, or worse yet, they had gas somewhere on board the airplane, they just couldn't find it. And that does happen on occasion too, depending on the complexity of the system of, of the airplane. But uh, which, which is really strange when you think about it, by the way, something just pops into my mind here. There's a lot of room in there. So occasionally stuff will pop in and I'll share it with you. 70% um, of all fuel exhaustion accidents occur within 10 miles of the airport. Can you believe that? That's an actual FA stat. 70% of all fuel exhaustion accidents within 10 miles of the airport. And get this, 50% of all fuel exhaustion accidents occur within one mile of the airport. Oh, what does that tell you? It tells you that people are almost perfect at being able to predict the amount of fuel they need to get to an airport, right? I mean, they're so close. So I guess as a good safety thing, what you should do is if you're planning a trip to an airport, pick an airport, and then find an airport that's one mile closer and land at that. And that should take care of at least 50% of the accidents with fuel exhaustion. The fact is that uh, aviation safety based on choices. And sometimes we make the wrong choices. And when we make the right ones, yeah, then we can be assured of flying safely. And in order to make the right choices, you have to ask yourself some questions sometimes. And my questions, I have a series of questions I'd like to ask you before I get to the, the main factor uh, upon which this presentation is built, what I think to be the single most 
uh, essential thing that one has to do in order to be safe in an airplane. But these five questions build the foundation toward that point. So here's my first question for you. What is the difference between you and somebody who crashed an airplane on any given day? Again, what is the difference between you as a uh, instrument, commercial, private pilot, whatever, and somebody else who crashed a pers an airplane on any given day? Think about that. And I'm gonna have a drink. This is iced tea, by the way, so it's, it's, it's iced tea, honest. So what is the difference? It's interesting because if I were to go to the home of the individual who crashed an airplane, and I were to look at his or her, typically it's a him, I, I look at his um, bookcase, like what you see back here. Uh, I'm going to, and, and I got to get these books back to the library tonight after the program. So they're all rentals. Um, I would see the same books that you have on your shelf. I would see, you know, perhaps um, Ernie Gann's book, uh, books by Barry Schiff, uh, books by Dan Namowitz. I, I would see books by all different authors about aviation safety and about the knowledge we need to fly safely. And it's interesting because there's no difference there. And then I'd probably find that he took a, this person took a biennial flight review and took a, a, a reasonable biennial flight review, not one that, uh, you know, you, you just pay a few dollars for, you walk in and you walk out. No, this, this person took an honest flight review. And I, I would look and, and what we find is this. We find that they do the exact same thing that you do. And you're looking for distinct differences. You know, you want to you see, you know, maybe, maybe this person has, a, you know, um, uh, something so distinctly different from him that you'll say, aha, that's the reason the person crashed. Maybe he has a, you know, um, I don't like my mom tattoo on his shoulder or something like that. You think that's why he crashed. Well, the fact is there's very little difference between somebody crashes who crashes and you. However, when you, when you look at it from a psychological, a forensic psychological level, you're able to discern the difference and the difference is in this. All right, you ready? Okay, do this for me right now. Just put your finger right there. Yeah, no, I want you to do this. This is a behavioral science intervention experiment. Everybody do this if you, if you would, because it's going to make this more effective. Because what I'm about to tell you is so important. I don't want it to go in one ear and out the other. All right? <laughs> so put your finger right there. Um, <coughs> the difference is between attitude and values. You see, attitudes are short-term behavioral dispositions. Values are long-term behavioral dispositions. Um, values are inculcated, reinforced over a period of decades so that they become part of your gestalt, part of your, your psychology. They are the reflexive patterns that drive you to behave consistently on any given day. And values are defined as those things that, you, that mean the most to you. That's how you discern your values. However, attitudes are short-term behavioral dis dispositions. And, and this, if, if something doesn't shock you, then, um, then this should. Your attitudes are easily uh, malleable. They're easily manipulated by outside sources, by tr uh, transient memories, by uh, other people's experiences. You can have a change in attitude instantly. And I'll give you an example. I, I remember this distinctly from junior high school in eighth grade. I walked up to Barbara Olario on the dance floor. The music was the Righteous Brothers song uh, called I Lost That Loving Feeling. And all of a sudden, I did something that was so uncharacteristic for me. I asked the head cheerleader at our school to dance. I was inspired. I did something that I didn't calculate the risk. I just had a change in attitude, a change in attitude because of an influence from an outside source. My personality, my values didn't change, but my attitude changed, compelled some behavior that wasn't the right behavior for me. And I walked up and I said, would you like to dance? Now, unbeknown to me, her uh, boyfriend was standing right next to her off to the side. I didn't know he was her boyfriend. And uh, all of a sudden he got very angry with me and they were playing, I lost that loving feeling. After he got angry with me, I was thinking a more appropriate song would be, I got that broken nose feeling. And I asked myself, why would I do such a thing? And the answer was, I had the wrong attitude for the time. Besides, you never want to ask a cheerleader to dance or ask a cheerleader uh, for a date because they always do it so expressively, like, no, no, never, never, no, no way. It's very embarrassing. 
So, uh, but attitudes can be changed by outside influences. That's interesting. So you surely have heard somebody say that uh, if a person crashes that, oh, Bob crashed and, you know, he was such a good pilot. Bob was such a good pilot. Well, maybe Bob was a good pilot, but he wasn't a good pilot that day or at that time. And that's the key. If you got that, you can take your finger out of your ear now. If you got that, then you understand that you could be a great pilot, but unless one is cognizant, is if one is, uh, unless one is always self-reflecting on what attitude one has at any given time, you may have the wrong attitude for the wrong time and end up like Bob who crashed an airplane at no reference to any Bob out there. Well, maybe that guy right there, but, but uh, no reference to anybody. Uh, that is uh, in the audience. The fact is that uh, attitudes can do that. And that's what makes it so scary. So realize your behavior can change. And the way that you keep or the, that you monitor that behavior is you ask yourself self-reflective questions. And that self-reflective question may be, for example, and these are the questions that I run over in my mind as a, a part of um, trying to maintain a higher awareness in a condition that requires a higher awareness. Uh, for example, if I'm in an airplane, I may have the attitude where I'm thinking about something other than what I need to be thinking about at the time. Maybe I'm thinking about what I'm going to do when I get home, what I'm going to have for dinner, or what I'm going to cook for dinner, um, So, uh, which I, I like to cook as, as, as long as I get my fire permit from the fire department. I will uh, gladly go ahead and cook most anything. Uh, I'll try it anyway. And I'll ask myself questions like, well, where am I going? How do I get there? What do I do next? Where am I going? How do I get there? What do I do next? These are the questions that help uh, constrain my focus and force me to have the right attitude for the right time. If I'm making an instrument approach, I'll ask myself how low, how long, which way. Once I intercept the localizer and that needle comes sweeping through the omni head and bangs up against the side of the glass and I manage to drag that needle back and finally get it centered. And uh, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> No, it's not that bad. Although I have to admit, the only needle I could keep successively uh, centered as a student uh, was the amp meter needle. That was uh, pretty, pretty effective for me, except when the strobe was on, then I, I just had a heck of a time. But the fact is, I'll ask myself, uh, how low, how long, which way when I'm making an instrument approach? So I'll know I'm focusing so I don't lose focus on what's necessary at the time. Where am I going? How do I get there? What do I do next? How low, how long, which way? If I change anything in the cockpit, such as a frequency, uh, a waypoint input, I'll do this. See it. I'll see it. I'll say it. Um, one, two, three point four, and then I'll check it. I'll go back and check it again. I need that error checking mechanism, and that's what we call reflective consciousness. And you get that by asking yourself questions. Powerful, powerful thing. Okay. Second question for you is this, where will you make the most important decisions you'll ever make in an airplane? Where? Think about that. Apparently you didn't hear the question. Some people still have their finger in both ears. So the, the, the answer is this, the most important decisions you'll ever make in an airplane have already been made and they were made on the ground. Now that is pretty powerful stuff when you think about it, because the most important, where will you make the most important decisions you'll ever make in an airplane? And the answer is on the ground, not in the air. And now for the question, focus on this. This is the question. Why is it that the most important decisions have to be made on the ground and can't be made in the air? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. I want you to know, this is iced tea. Honest. I know it looks like a cosmopolitan, but my wife makes me wonderful red iced tea. So that's the fact. So where, uh, in this case, where will you make the most important decisions? On the ground. Why? Because the most important decisions you'll ever make require, require, justify, justify, say it. Even though I can't hear you folks out there, say it. Say it, say it. Justification. That's exactly correct. The most important decisions you'll ever make in an airplane require justification. And folks, in the airplane, you don't have time to justify making the most important decisions you're ever going to make. It just doesn't work like that because the cockpit is a place for reflex, not reflection. So think about that. I get all excited about these questions because I know how important they are in helping us focus and develop the right attitude for flying. 
And so you think, okay, the most important decisions I'm ever going to be made, ever make are going to be made on the ground because they require justification. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What kind of decision are you talking about? Okay, I'll give you one. Let's say you're flying a, uh, a Cessna 150 uh, Landomatic and you don't have very good instrumentation in it because it's a rental. And uh, no, not because uh, many rentals with very good instrumentation. Uh, your Cessna 150, for example, has l the latest in Gosport tube technology and wing, wing warping uh, technology. So you're in great shape here. However, you don't have instrument uh, instruments necessary for IFR flight, nor are you instrument current, or let's just say you don't have an instrument rating. And I, I'm sorry to say that the instrument rating that comes from Microsoft Flight Simulator, yeah, the FA doesn't quite recognize that. So that doesn't count. And let's say all of a sudden you're surrounded by clouds and you are being, they're surrounding you. Clouds have been following you on your cross country for the last hour. And folks, you have a choice. <clears throat> you can try to make the nearest airport, which happens to be 50 miles away, and there's a good chance you're not going to be able to reach it before you go actual IFR. Or, or you can put the airplane down in a grass field directly below you. Very simple choice. Proceed on and probably get consumed by a fog bank or a cloud bank or a cumulus cloud or land the airplane in a grass field. What would you do? The, the fact is that in order to put the airplane on the grass, there's a lot of, there's a, a actually a rather complex heuristic we have to go through inside our psyche. In other words, a, a plot and planning scheme, a series of questions we have to ask ourselves, because what we're going to do is going to be something that we're going to have to explain to the FAA when they show up on a clear day. So if you haven't justified that decision beforehand, it's unlikely you're going to be able to justify that in the air with any type of aplomb or calmness about you. And as a result, you might make the wrong decision. Folks, this is a no-brainer. Unfortunately, for some people, it really is a no-brainer and they'll continue to fly along because they don't have a good explanation or they haven't rationalized how they would explain that to the FAA. And my response to you is you put the airplane on the grass as I would do because in this situation, you can't fly it safely. Then you take you take your GPS, take a reading, you get up to the top of the tallest hill or tower and you call the person that rented you that airplane with your cell phone and you say, hello, Bob? Yes. Hey, this is Rod. You rented the airplane for me on the cross-country flight? Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you where to find it. And you go ahead and you read your GPS coordinates to him because now you are on the ground, you are safe. And remember this, airplanes are only made of metal. They can be repaired. You can't easily repair a human body. So an analog to that question is this, the most important decisions you'll ever make are made on the ground and made before flight. Here's another question. How big of an animal are you willing to hit before you turn your car into oncoming traffic? Have you ever thought about that? How big of an animal are you willing to hit before you turn your car into oncoming traffic? What, squirrel? I mean, would you hit a squirrel? Would you avoid a squirrel turning into oncoming traffic just to avoid hitting the squirrel? Maybe you would. I wouldn't. I would do that. If, I mean, I don't want to, I would never want to hurt a squirrel unless, unless of course it deserved it, but I, I would never want to do that. If I saw a squirrel on the road, you know, I, I, I would say, oh no, squirrel. Oh, like that. But if there's oncoming traffic, I am not going to swerve and ch take the risk of uh, hurting myself, my family, uh, to avoid a squirrel. I'd just keep driving and go, hasta la vista, baby, <laughs> like that, and then just keep right on driving, and then go back and make a hat out of it, hat out of it later. Uh, but no, I don't want to hurt any animal. And my wife is probably hearing me say this. She's, she's a vegetarian, and she doesn't believe in killing any animal, unless, of course, it barks at night. So that's an entirely different story. Uh, she comes from a whole long line of vegetarians because her family realized many years ago, it's a whole lot easier to sneak up on plants. So anyway, the point is squirrel, no. What about a cow? If a cow walked out on the road, would you, would you hit a cow? You see, these are decisions you have to make ahead of time. No sense waiting until the moment actually uh, arrives to make the decision. I'm not gonna hit a cow. Folks, uh, I, will take the, I will take the chance, maybe, maybe more likely, of turning into oncoming traffic to avoid a cow because if I hit the cow and flipped it up in the air, the stakes would be higher, literally and figuratively in that sense, pun intended. So 
Uh, that's a very, very important thing. Think about this. Here's a book. And this was written by, uh, oh, me. And I'd like to quote Wyatt Earp, if I may. As you remember from the fly out, uh, from the uh, shootout at the OK Corral in the, 17, uh, the 1880s, this was a very famous shootout, Wyatt Earp and the uh, Clanton gang. Here's what it, uh, he, this, Wyatt Earp wrote five books. He had five biographies, and they were pretty consistent about this shootout. Through Wyatt Earp says, when Billy Clanton and Frank McClory do their, drew their pistols, I knew it was a fight for life. Billy Clanton leveled his pistol at me, but I did not aim at him. I knew that Frank McClory had the reputation of being a good shot and a dangerous man. And I aimed at Frank McClory first. The first two shots were fired by Billy Clanton and myself. My, uh, he shooting at me, Billy Clanton shooting at Wyatt, and Wyatt shooting at Frank McClory. I, I, I don't know which shot was fired first. We fired almost simultaneous, then the fight became general. So Wyatt Earp went into the shootout, but it actually happened behind Faye's photography studio. It just didn't sound as sexy as the OK Corral. But Wyatt Earp went into that shootout knowing who was the most dangerous man and who he was going to shoot first should a, uh, a fight begin. It's an amazing thing. And that's why Wyatt Earp survived, which is no surprise really when you think about it because Wyatt Earp was a frontier gambler and he knew how to assess risk. So that's the second question. Third question is this, what is your greatest strength and, what is, and why is it your greatest weakness? What is your greatest strength and why is it your greatest weakness? Okay, I know you're all clamoring to answer so I'm, I'm getting that psychically, psychically. Actually, I'm getting it psychotically. So uh, I'm getting it, though. That's the most important thing. Um, the greatest strength and greatest weakness. Your greatest strength is empathy. In other words, the feeling that we have for our fellow human being. Your greatest weakness is your empathy. The feeling you have for your greatest, for your fellow human being. In other words, the fact is we do not like to displease people. We want to make people happy. Dr. Jerry Harvey, about 25 years ago, did some amazing research on agreements and disagreements. And what Jerry Harvey, Dr. Jerry Harvey found was this, and I'll phrase it in a question. With whom do you think you can uh, more easily, uh, with whom do you think it is safer to deal with? Somebody you disagree with or somebody you agree with. And I'm talking about safety over the long run in terms of preventing issues, angst, personal problems, and things like that. On the, in, on the immediate level, who do you think is easier to deal with? Do, people you disagree with or people that you agree with? Now, this may come as a surprise, but the answer is people you disagree with are actually easier to deal with in the sense that they don't cause as many long-term problems. And the reason for that is you know exactly where they stand. People you agree with, however, may say that they are in agreement with you and then change their mind later because they really weren't in the first place. In Southern California, three out of four marriages end in divorce. And the other one ends in murder, I believe, something like that. Well, maybe not murder, but maybe something close. And you think, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it possible people could actually agree to get married and then realize this is really not for me and then not uh, abrogate the agreement, not break the agreement off? Is that possible? <laughs> you bet it is. Every time I, I look on a freeway and see half a house going down uh, the, the freeway, on a big flatbed truck, my first thought is, whew, divorce is a terrible thing. And then I think, I wonder what the kids look like. So, uh, you know, sometimes people have a hard time uh, renegotiating their agreement. So what does that mean to you in an airplane? It means this, you agree to go fly with people. You don't want to disappoint them because if you made an agreement, then you stick with the agreement for as long as you can. And then all of a sudden you say enough is enough because you realize you made a bad agreement. 
if you go flying with somebody and they all and you you agree to take them somewhere, you know, you now have a verbal contract with these people. And therefore, you've made an agreement that can cause problems in the long run if for some reason you decide to break your agreement with them, such as if the weather's bad. Now you have to disappoint these people. Or such as if the airplane's not running the way you want it to run. Now you've got to disappoint these people. You see, folks, that is an issue that we need to deal with before we ever get in an airplane. The most important decisions you ever make before you get in an airplane. Hmm. So how do we do that? Let me tell you uh, what my friend Pete does. Uh, and it, it's a classy way of handling flights anytime you get in an airplane with somebody. And that is number one, you ask everybody, and when I say everybody, clearly I'm not talking about a Cessna 150, uh, because in a Cessna 150, there is no everybody. There's only, hey you, if you're lucky, because you only can carry one person. Um, but in a 172, you have three people in the airplane, you ask them, okay, well, if that's the case, you guys want to go flying with me, I'm going to take you somewhere, but I have a question for you. Is there anyone here who would be unwilling or so um, dramatically inconvenienced that if we had to stop midway on our trip and spend the night in order to avoid bad weather or have the airplane uh, uh, looked at because of some suspicious activity under the cowl, and you can find a good euphemism for that, uh, or we just had to return home, is there anyone here, any one of you three, that would be so inconvenienced that it would be um, a major traumatic experience for you? Could you not deal with that? And most people are going to say, no, of course not. We completely understand. The moment they say that, what you've done is you've made them part of the decision-making process. And by doing that, now you make it, and here's the key, you make it easier on yourself later on to say, listen, uh, we've got to turn back. The weather's too bad. There's a bunch of clouds chasing students all over the place. A thunderstorm has been trailing us for the last six hours. Um, and we just got to go back. And that's fine. Now, my question to you is, is that going to make them any less disappointed in your choice? No, it's not. It's just going to make it easier for you to make the right choice because you've made them part of the decision-making process. Fourth question, what's the most expensive airplane you've ever flown? What is the most expensive airplane? And by the way, just to make sure I reference, get me so excited, I sometimes forget to summarize. Pete helps spread the decision, making people part of the decision-making process so it takes the pressure off of him. If you got that? You got it. That's very important information to have because it keeps you from having a bad attitude or the wrong attitude, the I'm going to please you attitude, when in reality, it, you, you need the I'm going to be frank with you attitude, even though frank may not be your name. So what uh, is the most expensive airplane you've ever flown? Most expensive. Think about that. Certainly isn't the Cessna 150 I purchased for $20,000. Yeah, even came with an engine, which is pretty, no pistons, but it did come with an engine. And uh, no, it, it was great. I actually bought this thing for $20,000. It's just insane. I put, uh, let's see, and then I got it and I flew it for a couple of years and then I put a $30,000 engine in it. So uh, I'm still thinking that might've been a good deal, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> but airplanes are so expensive sometimes, but it's totally worth it though. You can get a good deal if you look around. Um, <clears throat> most expensive airplane I've ever flown. Okay, most expensive airplane I've ever flown. King Air. King Air, most expensive airplane I've ever flown would cost me more, no more than $5,000 to replace. Honest to goodness. I'm not lying to you. I'm not making it up either. I'm not making it I save all the making up stuff for the very end of the webinar. There's a whole section de dedicated to rod making up stuff. And the most expensive airplane I've ever flown is $5,000 because that is the deductible. That's right. The most expensive airplane you're ever going to fly is essentially whatever the deductible is for that airplane. It was $5,000 on the King Air. I could come up with $5,000 if I had to. I would sell my flight instructor car at the time, my flight instructor car that I had, and then I'd only have to come up with $4,950 more. And, um, okay, $4,960 maybe. <clears throat> so $5,000, or I could leave town. I still have the airplane. I could leave right now and not have to worry about the deductible. 
But the fact is, that's why we have insurance. We have insurance for two reasons. One, to prevent catastrophic financial burden on the part of the person who needs or purchased the insurance. And the second reason we have insurance is to keep you from making a bad decision about trying to save the airplane at the expense of the people on board. And that is so fundamentally important. So think about that the next time you're uh, in an airplane. That's why you have insurance. Last question is this, who do you fly for? Who do you fly for? Airline, fly for a 135 operation, fly for an FBO, fly for Bob, for Bob's air charter service. There actually was a, a Bob's, there was a, what was, it, what was the name of that service up there in McGrath, Alaska? Oh yeah, Chuck. It was a Chuck's charter service. And in Alaska, when things happen, you know, I used to do a lot of speaking in Alaska. And one time the FA guy told me, he said, yeah, we had a guy named uh, Chuck up at McGrath airport. And uh, he was just a real character. And he put a sign, Chuck put a sign on his window. He had a 135 operation. He said, uh, we fly when the airlines won't try your luck with Chuck. That was the actual sign. And the FA made him uh, take it down. And uh, that was, uh, <laughs> that's just the way things work in Alaska sometimes. So, um, you know, who do you fly for? Hopefully it's not Chuck at McGrath Airport. And the answer is you fly for yourself. I don't care who you work for. I don't care if you work with a ma major airline and more power to you if you do. I think that's wonderful. You're a very lucky person to be able to fly for a living like that. But ultimately, you fly for yourself. If you think you are flying for somebody else, then your obligation then is solely to please that person. And that is a very dangerous a mental disposition to have because what it does is it... Um, disrupts you from having the proper attitude. It can easily mislead you in a sense that you become now uh, more willing to please than anything, more willing to please than you are to function uh, as a good steward for the aircraft and the people under your custody. And think about this. There was a fellow by the name of Ed Viesters who was one of, the, I think he still is, uh, the top premier mountain climber in the world. Number one, this guy has climbed K1, K2, Everest, Special K, Special K, Special K. I think they climb that in the morning, right after breakfast. And Ed Viesters was interviewed by <clears throat> Mountain Magazine. And Ed Viesters had a reputation of being the most conservative mountain climber in the business. He would sometimes not climb when other folks were climbing. And they'd say, where's Ed? Well, he just decided not to climb today. And Mountain Magazine kind of caught on to that. And they, in the interview, the interviewer asked Ed, said, you know, we noticed that some people will climb mountains when, when you won't. Why is that? And in absolutely the most appropriate, magnificent response that I almost, when I read it, I almost stood in my chair uh, and, and clapped, which would have been unusual because the, the people at Denny's would have thought that was very strange. But uh, Ed said, I climb mountains for myself. I don't climb them for other people. Whoa, whoa, that is insanely great. The most appropriate response to that question anybody could give. I climb them for myself. And that's why Ed became the safest and was one of the safest and a premier mountain climber and well-respected. Well-respected despite the fact that he wouldn't always, he wouldn't climb every mountain every day. Folks, that's gold. That's gold. Five questions. All right. Now, let me tie this all together. We still have enough time to do this, folks. Jeremy? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to tie this, tie this all together. Hope you're uh, following me. Five questions that built the foundation that help you sustain, well, first of all, uh, develop and maintain the right attitude because it gets you thinking about the kind of pilot that you want to be in an aircraft. And if you think that's, by the way, silly thinking, uh, that's, it's not deciding what kind of pilot you want to be in an airplane is fundamental to, to say flying. And if you think it's silly, well, then that's kind of like believing that a hedge fund is, you know, the uh, something that people get because they can't afford their own shrubbery or, or believing that Winnipeg is a game show for pirates. That, that's just not true. This is a very effective way of thinking to help maintain the right attitude. So um, ultimately it all boils down to this thing. 
if you want to be safe in an airplane, you have to have the right attitude, but you have to know what can uh, uh, change the attitudes you have, sometimes in ways that you can't recognize. And in order to do that, you have to understand human nature. Let me give you one of the best examples of human nature that I've, I've ever come across. It was, it's just excellent. This is out of Ulysses S. Grant. I didn't write this book, by the way. Uh, this is out of U Ulysses S. Grant's uh, uh, memoirs. And I found it fascinating. Believe it or not, I'm actually going to have to put on a different pair of glasses to read this. Uh, yeah, my doc says now I'm only two lenses away from being a fly. So that's very comforting, actually. It, Ulysses S. Grant was a lieutenant during the Mexican War, but he never actually was in charge of everything. Uh, he, he was just a, a, a subcomponent, and very effective one, by the way, uh, during the Mexican War, U.S.-Mexican War. And during the Civil War, when he got his first command as a, actually, this would have been his second command as a colonel, when they brought him back, Lincoln realized that, uh, you know, they were going to give him another chance to demonstrate his, his chops. He was uh, going after Colonel Thomas Harris, who was uh, with the South, of course. And he said, when we reached the point f uh, from which the valley below us was in full view, I halted. The place where Harris had been encamped a few days before was still there, and the marks of a recent encampment were plainly visible. It occurred to me, it, my heart resumed its place. In other words, he calmed down a little bit because no one was there. It occurred to me that once Harris had been, uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, at once that Harris had been as much afraid of me as I had been of him. And this was a view of the question I had never taken before because you know, once he showed up, Harris took off. So from that event, to the close of the war, I never experienced trepidation upon confronting an enemy, though I always felt more or less anxiety. I never forgot that he had as much reason to fear my forces as I had his. Now, the point is that Ulysses S. Grant discovered a fundamental of human nature, and that is we all share the same fears. Why? Well, we have, may have different expression of those fears, but we all share the same fears pretty much. Uh, I, I mean, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the total, not in the micro, but in the macro. And so once he realized that, he gained a tremendous amount of wisdom. And in order to be wise, one has to understand human nature. And when one does understand human nature, then we say that that person has common sense. And that's a, that's a fundamental thing, because when you think about uh, this aspect of human nature, it can lead us astray if we don't understand it. And the classic example is Apollo 10. And with Apollo 10, you had Gene Cernan, Tom Stafford, and John Young. And the Apollo 10 mission was to, if you remember back in 1969, May, was to descend out of orbit from, in Snoopy, from the uh, command module, go down to 47,000 feet, make a couple of circles around the moon, take some pictures, a couple selfies, and then shoot back up into space. And the amazing thing was that that's exactly what the crew members did. Uh, Gene Cernan and Stafford went down, they made a couple circles, and they went back up. Why did they do that? Because the head of mission control, the head of NASA at the time, Thomas Paine, only gave them enough gas to go down, make a couple of circles, and go back up. They didn't give them enough gas to land. Why did Thomas Paine not give them enough gas to land? Because he knew that human nature might compel them to do something that they would not ordinarily do. We're talking about some of the most highly trained individuals, some of the most disciplined and highly regarded individuals in the US military, and Thomas Paine didn't trust them. He didn't trust, it's not that he didn't trust them, he didn't trust their human nature. Only a certain amount of fuel. So what does that mean to you? And by the way, I, I mean, if they had enough gas, would they have landed? Well, think about it. If they did land, maybe they went down, did a touch and go on the moon, or a couple of touch and goes, uh, or a full stop, uh, had the option with a big crater, they could actually stop, get out all around for a while and go back up. Who is going to spank the first man that landed on the moon? Nobody. 
nobody. This guy's going to be a hero. So Thomas Paine was very, very wise. And that's why uh, he basically only gave him enough gas for two circles around the planet. So the point to you is this. If, that can, if uh, people who are highly trained like that can be subject to their own human nature, then uh, you certainly can too. So can I. So we have to have a means of guarding against that. And let me tie this all together by bringing it together by saying this. How do you guard against your own human nature? And I'll take you back to 15th century um, feudal Japan, the years 1475. Your name is Miyamoto Musashi. You are uh, challenged with protecting the emperor, and that is your job. You will sacrifice your life to protect the emperor. And Musashi had 60 or fought 60 major battles. And uh, in one battle, or it actually turned out not to be a battle, the uh, assailant came to attack the emperor. Musashi saw the assailant approach. This is right out of the book of five rings. Musashi's book that he wrote, uh, a book of the book of five rings. Musashi prepared himself, readied the Iido position, drew his sword, got within arm's length, double arm's length distance of his assailant, and the assailant spat in Musashi's face. Spittle running down Masashi's face. Masashi stopped, resheathed his sword, turned, and walked away. Now that is very uncharacteristic for any samurai warrior. Why did he do that? Because obviously there's a certain amount of humiliation associated with that and embarrassment. And Masashi did that for one very important reason. Because the moment Spittle hit his face, he became angry. And the samurai warrior lived by a code of ethics. It's what drives them. It's what gives them life. It what, it's what keeps them as safe as a samurai warrior can be. Masashi became angry. And one of the codes that, the, uh, that is delineated in the Book of Five Rings is, you shall never strike an enemy in anger. Never. Masashi was angry, and instead of ab ab abrogating his code, being uh, an infidelious to his code, he decided it was much better to accept the temporary embarrassment and shame and walk away. And here's what we've learned from that. The most proficient pilots, the most capable pilots that you'll ever experience or ever get to know are individuals who fly by a code of ethics. And that code of ethics is known as a Bushido, B-U-S-H-I-D-O, B-U-S-H-I-D-O, Bushido. In, uh, sounds like we're in fourth grade, doesn't it? Sounds just like Catholic school, except there's no, uh, you know, rulers aren't flying across the, uh, the room here and uh, people aren't being chased and threatened uh, with, uh, you know, visit to the Pope's office. So and I went to Catholic school for a long time. It was pretty bizarre. In fact, just as an aside, I, in my first, in sixth grade, I built a working model of the solar system for my Catholic school science fair. And it had the sun and the earth rotating around the sun. And of course, when the, uh, um, the head priest came in and took a look at that, he was very upset. And they uh, sentenced me to house arrest for six months until I recanted and built the appropriate model with everything rotating around the earth. I'm just kidding. I'm just making that up. That's not, that's not true. That really didn't happen. Could have happened, but it didn't happen here. So Bushido, Code of Ethics. And there are about 100 individual items in this, bush, in this uh, Bushido for the samurai warrior. And my point to you is this, pilots develop their own code of ethics. Typically, they come from association with other individuals. But the ones that have the most meaning come from the experience of, I will never, ever, ever do that again. And I know you've had that experience. I've had that experience. Anybody, anybody who's been out of the pattern has had that experience. And those are very valuable experiences, folks, because if something... Something made you say, I will never, ever do that again. Like, you know, for example, landing low on fuel, having to declare a, a low fuel alert or minimum fuel, as we, as we call it. My gosh, that is a bad thing that happened to you. But it's gold in one sense, because now that has the emotional impact to become part of your delineated Bushido, the things you will and will not do. And this is what gives you power. What gives you power is once you have a Bushido of things you will and will not do, you, wait for it, 
wait for it. This is, this is the best part. You will now have a more, you are now more likely to behave in a more logical, responsible manner, and you don't have to explain it to anybody. The only person you have to explain it to is yourself. In other words, you only have to adhere to the Bushido to know you're doing the right thing because of the experience you've had that supported that Bushido. Like, oh, I'll never let that happen to me again. That's your thing. You don't have to explain it. You can just say, I'm not going to fly today and I don't have to explain why. But if you want to, of course, you know, uh, socially gracious that you are, you can. But uh, uh, explanation is not necessary. Ultimately, it boils down to this. You don't have to explain you follow your Bushido because it's a matter of honor to follow your Bushido, your personal code of ethics. So let me leave you with this one last point in conclusion of my, my uh, program here, and that is this. If you are conducting yourself in a safe and efficient manner, you are controlling uh, the forces that can alter your attitude in a way that uh, is not favorable, not conducive to safety, knowing that your attitudes are temporary behavioral dispositions. And uh, you, you know that uh, you're not that much difference from somebody who crashed an airplane on any given day. You read the NTSB reports just like this person, which by the way is kind of strange. I don't know why. Reading NTSB reports to learn how to fly safely, that's kind of like reading the obituaries for health tips. But you know, people do it. So whatever. And you know, where you'll make the most important decisions on the ground and not in the air because they require justification. You know, your greatest strength is your willingness to please other people, but it's also your greatest weakness. So you do what Pete does. And that is you get other people to participate in the decision. The most expensive airplane you'll ever fly is no more than $5,000 and you fly for yourself. You can keep those things in mind and realize that anything you do in an airplane, it's a matter of you're doing it because you're following a Bushido that you have forged out of experiences of a, sometimes emotional trauma, scared yourself, you know, uh, scared your wheel pants off, so to speak. You know it's the right thing to do, and you're doing it because it's a matter of honor. And here's the last phrase. In the movie Rob Roy, probably one of the best quips ever mentioned in a, in a movie came from Liam Neeson, who played Rob Roy. And Liam Neeson said this, honor is something no man can give you. It's something no man can take away. Honor is man's gift to himself. Honor is something no man can give you. It's something no man can take away. Honor is man's gift to himself. And therefore, when you fly, you fly according to your Bushido. Nobody else has to give you praise for that. You do it because of your own internal reward mechanism. You know it's a matter of honor. That's my story. And before I uh, go back to my uh, two friends here, Paul and uh, Jeremy, I say this, uh, I do have a code that you can go to on and use on my website. It's 30 off, 30O, capital O, capital F, capital F, at rodmachado.com or becomeapilot.com, either one of those. Rod Machado, M A C H A D O.com, or become a pilot.com. And you get 30% off of um, any of the digital products that are available, or the audiobooks, or the ebooks that are available on my site. And um, I would recommend this one. I mean, this is a, this is a book called uh, Plane Talk and the uh, Art, Mental Art of Flying an Airplane. 100 chapters of um, information on. Well, basically psychology and practical utilities you can use in the airplane to keep you safe and also a few fun articles too. Paul, Jeremy, that uh, takes care of it for me. I think we're ready for some questions now. Sounds good. Thank you, Rod. I really appreciate it. Um, I, really appreciate it. I, I just wanted to start off and, and say that uh, no squirrels were harmed in the making of this webinar. Um, nice. Yeah, referring <laughs> nice. back to you running over squirrel comment there. Um, there, there actually, there, there are some pretty good questions in here. Uh, is your code of ethics another name for personal minimums? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, they're certainly synonymous. Um, I, I just couched it in a slightly different way, but if you want to think of them as being synonymous terms, that's, uh, that's personally, that's fine with me. They do, they accomplish the same thing. So uh, in personal minimums, that idea is, uh, is, is actually a brilliant idea. I love it. That's fantastic. 
Next question. Uh, I've heard a pilot start to become safe the first time they say no. Uh, what was your first no experience and how hard was it to say no? And how do you teach your students who just can't seem to say no? Yeah, well, um, by way of a short story, Richard Bem at Stanford University did research on role modeling many, many years ago, back in the 1970s. Here's what Richard Bem, B-E-M, says. He said, um, the single strongest force that affects our beliefs and values is role modeling. Excuse me. We are more likely to be influenced, our behavior to be influenced by those uh, from whom or uh, of whom we role model. Now that's, think about that. I mean, think about when you were a kid and you saw the Lone Ranger jump from a, a rock onto a horse, you went, oh my God, that's fantastic. And so you went out on your porch and jumped on your Schwinn bicycle. Same thing. It just hurt a lot more. And you sang soprano in a boys' choir for the next two weeks after that. But <laughs> you get the point. So how do I do that with my students? I simply give them an opportunity to see me say no. There's just no more effective way to do that. And on occasion, we may elect to start off on a flight where I know I can accomplish something else other than a cross-country flight or head in a certain direction. And I'll say, nah, that's just not appropriate. It's a little too bumpy. Visibility is not appropriate. Uh, maybe there's a TFR there, or a, a stadium or a stadium TFR, a stadium TFR that's fogged in, whatever. You know, see something there and then I'll say, I'll go, I'll go back the other way. Or I may say that's an airplane component that needs to be replaced. We're not going to fly this airplane today. I'll let them see me do that. It's powerful, powerful stuff in terms of long-term behavioral influence. One way. There's several other ways, but that's just one way. Gotcha. Oh, and by the way, the answer to the question, what was my experience that allowed me to say no? I had quite a few of them. But I'll tell you, when I, I remember being 30 years old, sitting on runway 25 at Long Beach Airport. And I'm flying out to the desert to do filming for Aileron Magazine. It was one of the original video magazines before it's the predecessor to ABC's Wide, Wide World of Flying. And, was, and I had to be out there. And uh, it was zero, zero. It was about a quarter mile visibility. I mean, I could make my way out the taxi. I got out to the run-up area and I, th I thought to myself, what, what am I doing? What, this, is in, I thought, this is insane. I had one of those existential epiphanies. And I realized I, I am risking my life in a Cessna 172. If this engine quit in zero, zero conditions, I'm going down. I'm turning my airplane into a lawn dart. That's what I'm doing. I have no control over where it's going, essentially because I don't know where to go. So I taxi back and said, guys, can't make it. And then I've had many of, I had many before that, but that, that's just one that sticks in my mind. That's way too risky. That's, uh, that, that was crazy for me. So don't do it anymore. Well, I haven't done that for decades. And would never do that again, by the way. <laughs> uh, so somebody asked, how many hours um, should you build before you do an IFR rating? And do you recommend an IFR rating for an older pilot? And it, it's not me asking the question. Somebody else asked this one. So, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> right. So I saw your wheelchair now. back there. Do Oxygen you, tank too. Come on. Give it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Uh, and, and do you recommend an IFR rating for uh, an older pilot that's flying just for fun? Take some time, catch your breath on this one, Paul, and uh, oh, yeah. uh, get out that cannula. You'll be fine. No, I'm just kidding. Paul. <laughs> Sometimes I can't help myself. This is why I got slapped so many times in Catholic school. Right. Uh, my sister, Sugar Ray Jiu-Jitsu. Um, by the way, I saw her on the Interfaith Kung Fu trials a while back. She took down a priest with a drop spin kick. Boy, powerful stuff. Anyway, enough uh, playing around here. The answer to your question on an IFR rating is, after you're done, after you obtain your private pilot license, uh, if you want to start working on your IFR rating, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and it's perfectly fine. What I like about that is it keeps you engaged in training. Yeah, why, it's, it's true that you learn a different type of flying, looking inside rather than outside. But um, that's still very valuable. And I would, I'd recommend, there, there are more pros than there are cons about that. So definitely do that. My, my preference would be to perhaps fly 50 hours of cross-country flying. In fact, if you want to know the single most important thing you can do after you get a private license to build your confidence, uh, take a cross-country flight. 
take a 200 mile cross country flight, take a 300, 400 mile cross country flight, go from some place where you have to cross the mountains into different terrain. Uh, in other words, a uh, high desert to uh, uh, middle United States or, or something like that. And it's amazing how much of a confidence builder that is. So, and as far as an older pilot, folks, excuse me, I have a video on YouTube that uh, is called, uh, what is it called? I have so many videos on YouTube. It's called The, uh, the Middle-Aged Pilot. And it talks about the research done on people that get older uh, and still want to fly. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, unless you're suffering from some sort of physical-based illness, some sort of dementia or uh, some, some horrifying, terrible thing like that, which, you know, it, that's typically not the case, um, then uh, you can still fly. And you know how you fly safely? You do exactly what Clint Eastwood said in the movie, The Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh no, that's where he said, nothing like a good piece of hickory. That's right, that's where he hit those guys with, with that. Uh, in, in one of Clint, he said, a man's gotta know his own limitations. Maybe that was The Outlaw Josie Wales, I don't know. And once you know your own limitations, then you say, yeah, I can do that. And I'll fly like this and maybe I won't do this and maybe I'll do this type of training. There's not a reason in the world you should give up flying uh, if you can find a way to do some flying in a safe, in a very safe manner. Even if it's only in the traffic pattern in your Piper Cub and, and you, you don't feel good going across country flights and doing all those other things then, or flying instruments, why not just fly around the pattern in, in your Cub and enjoy yourself and have a great time? That's still flying. So my opinion, good question, by the way. Rod, this question comes directly from me and I, I, I'm pretty sure I already know what the answer is going to be because I, I know what mine is to myself, but to you as a flight instructor, uh, when did you really feel that you learned how to fly an aircraft? That's to, to be, to be honest with you, I think after I got my private license, I felt like I was pretty confident except I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> That's the problem. I, I, so, um, you know, I, and it, this is not just a statement of humility. You know what I do when I get in an airplane with somebody? Of course you don't. Uh, you, you, you haven't been there. And I don't have the video cameras running all the time. What I do is this. I say, listen, if you see I'm doing anything wrong or you, you see there's anything I can do to improve uh, what I'm doing, I say, feel free to mention it. You know, I, I just like learning different things from people. You have no idea the crazy things I've learned from people, good things, powerful things, all because I was willing to put my ego aside and just learn. Now, I'm not saying if somebody says, hey, hey, uh, you know, I asked for straight and level flight and you asked me, which one of those do you want first? And, uh, and that's not right. <laughs> right. Uh, if, in that case, I, I may feel embarrassed. Okay, okay, great. And then I got to work on that. And I'll say, okay, well, he's telling me the right thing. And yeah, no, this is right. I, I, if I lie to myself, then I can't, I can't be truthful with anybody. So I say, no, that's right. No, I don't want to. Sometimes you just have to say, yeah, the person made a good observation. Now that doesn't happen all the time. I mean, it, it happens on occasion, rare occasion, but occasionally it will happen. Somebody with a lot of experience in a certain airplane that I don't have much experience in. So I just learn. That's what I do. And I put aside my ego. So in that sense, I'm learning all the time. But I, I would say this, though. Uh, the first time I took an aerobatic lesson, everything changed. Because as soon as you take an aerobatic lesson, you realize, take a couple lessons, you realize that you can predict exactly what an airplane is going to do. And it's the inability to predict what the airplane is going to do that causes people fear and frustration. I will take people out, go out and fly on, uh, at, at some of the local airports, go to Chino, do crosswind landings uh, or Ramona, actually at, uh, at Ramona, uh, it was Rancho California at one time that they had, this, which is the ultimate crosswind landing runway out there. It's gone now, blew away. And uh, it is such a confidence building experience for them. So you find out what scares you and you tackle it, drag it to the ground, wrestle it and uh, threaten it so that it never scares you again which that's how you solve your fear that's how you deal with it and i think that just answered one of the questions here which was what are some of the strategies for reducing the anxiousness um yeah i think that kind of goes hand in hand there um i'll give you a personal story in 1989 i saw a juju i've been practicing martial arts for 20 years prior to that 
actually more like 18. Started in 1975, I think. And uh, I, uh, uh, I saw a video titled Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in Action. <clears throat> and it showed these jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys that would take these trained martial artists down. And um, it, they, they take them down in an instant. No stand-up martial artist could beat them. They take them down to the ground and get them to, to play their game. In other words, the jujitsu game. So at first I thought, well, everything I ever learned about martial arts is gone, thrown out the window. What a total waste. The exercise was good and learned how to make a lot of great sounds like hiya, which is Japanese for the word ouch. And because uh, martial arts taught me how to break bones. Mostly they were my bones. But uh, anyway, so I saw this and for a couple of days I was pretty depressed and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. So <laughs> I'm not following my own, I'm not using what I know. So I thought, I got to take lessons from these guys. So I went down and signed up for lessons with Hicks and Gracie, probably the single most uh, competent, capable master in Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, that came out of Brazil. And I spent five years with him doing uh, training, all because of one thing, all because of, I was afraid to be taken to the ground and, and if I ever had to defend myself. It scared the heck out of me because I, I, I did not like being on the ground. And now I would rather be on the ground than any other place in the world, except in an airplane, of course. If we're talking about airplanes, I'd rather be in the air. So that's a, that, I mean, that's, that's how I feel about it. You've, you have to tackle the thing that scares you. However, there is something called systematic desensitization. So psychological term meaning that if something really scares you, you have to tackle it incrementally. You decide what baby steps you need and you move closer and closer and closer uh, incrementally to completing or um, engaging in the behavior that actually does scare you with a sympathetic flight instructor, by the way, an empathetic flight instructor. That's very, very important. And they're around, you, you know, the, the most important thing you can do, by the way, is find a good flight instructor. As the old Chinese saying goes, it's better to spend three years looking for a good flight instructor than to spend three minutes with a bad one. And that sounds so much more authentic in the original Mandarin in which it was issued. I don't speak Mandarin though. Every time I try, I get takeout. So, <laughs> so I probably run, rubbed a couple countries the wrong way <laughs> so far. I don't want to get you guys in trouble. Anyway, <laughs> go, go ahead. Next question. So uh, what is your definition of a professional pilot? Let's see. <clears throat> a person that has a code of ethics based on safety and follows those code of ethics and strives to know his own human nature. That would be my, my definition of a professional pilot. And that can be somebody who is a uh, student pilot or somebody with like, you know, well, Neil Armstrong was with like a, a thousand billion hours of flying time. Wouldn't you like to see his logbook, by the way? Can you imagine <laughs> on uh, just before in, in July, you know, you see touch and goes, touch and goes, touch and goes, cross country, moon, yeah. <laughs> touch and goes on moon, return, cross country, touch and goes, touch and goes. That had to be an amazing logbook to see, but anyway. Next question. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm just Pardon entertaining you. myself, which is what <laughs> I always do when I don't have a camera to talk to. No, no, no. That, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Uh, so somebody wanted to know, and here, a personal question. Are you ready for it? Ready. Where, where did you start your aviation career? The airport FBO flight school. Yes, I started, and I, I'm proud to say this, Amelia Reed gave me my first job in aviation at Reed Hillview Airport in 1970. And uh, Amelia had, it was one of the best experiences you could ever have. First of all, you didn't need a security clearance and a badge to get onto the airport and then sign up with the TSA for five years uh, and sent off to, uh, you know, some foreign legion area for training. Um, you, you could walk onto an airport. And I sat on her doorstep for, honest to goodness, for three weeks. I'd go back every day and say, do you have a job for me? Do you have a job for me? And she got classic uh, to, to, to a fault here. Uh, she, she said, okay, I'll give you a job. Just stop asking me for a job. And she was the greatest lady, just amazing lady. And that's where I got my start. And I rented uh, flight instructors, airplanes for $9 an hour and uh, flight instructors, $6 an hour. And the flight instructors, airplanes were rented wet. And the flight instructor was, uh, was already wet when I got <laughs> it because he had been sweating from the other student before me. I just wetted them up though, made them sweat more. So it was great fun. I learned in a warbird, so to speak, 
which is what the L2 was. Go ahead. Next question. All right. One of our instructors that are dialed in tonight asks, what would be your advice to a newly minted CFI who has yet to sign or send his student off for a practical test or solo? Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a great question, by the way. And my advice would be, uh, there are only two ways to get smart. Read a lot of books and ask a lot of questions. Only two ways. Read a lot of books, ask a lot of questions. And when I say read a lot of books, start with this one. Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I know that sounds strange. Dale Carnegie, that doesn't sound like an aviation book to me. I don't remember him being an AOPA pilot. Well, he's not. Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's one of the single most valuable books that any young person can purchase because what it does is it tells you, well, it tells you all the things you need to know about human nature of other individuals that will help you connect with them. And it doesn't just say this is a function of human nature. It just says things like rule number 65, always speak in terms of another person's interest. What a concept. Because you start doing that and all of a sudden as a young person, you may not have a lot to bring to the table, but then suddenly uh, older people start to think, you know, that, that kid, he likes to know what I know. He wants to help me. He's a nice kid. I think I'm going to help him out somehow. I think I'm going to keep my eyes open and help him get a flying job maybe because he's such a nice guy and I want to do something for him. You have to be able to bring something to the table. So the, and the next thing is, uh, like I say, read a lot of books, ask a lot of questions. And I would recommend anything Barry Schiff has written, grab it, read it. Uh, anything that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself here because all of a sudden when I start forcing myself to think about these things, there are so many people who have written so many wonderful books and they're all up here. Rich Dole's book on how to fly an air, uh, excuse me, uh, let's see, Stall Awareness, great book right here. This is super. Uh, let's see. And here's one. Uh, let's see. Oh, they're, they're all up there. there. There's so many different ones um, and that would be great. Or you, if you want, you could also read this one right here. Uh, Plain talk. And let's see, we have any other ones here? Oh, I have about seven that I've written and they're all good for, oh, try this one. Um, right here, stand by, just real quick. And this is, I think, one of my most, uh, in, I, I think, uh, I, I like to think useful contributions to all new flight instructors and people learning to fly. This is a book uh, titled uh, How to Fly an Airplane Handbook. And let's see if I can do it this way never tried to do this with a camera here, but it's all about the, the different maneuvers, highly, uh, very visual, and it's extremely detailed. It's all based on stick and rudder flying skills. All the things I learned from a World War II driven flight school, all the instructors, many of the instructors, not all, were uh, World War II pilots. And if you didn't know how to fly stick and rudder as a World War II pilot, you weren't going to fly very long safely. Uh, you would be, you, you wouldn't last but a couple of sorties in enemy territory. So I was so very fortunate to learn that. And that's what I have in that book. Remember, 30OFF, 30 capital OFF, 30% off on any of the digital ebooks, audiobooks, and e learning courses. And by the way, they all go into uh, uh, my wife's favorite charity, um, Neiman Marcus. There you go. So, yeah, that's it. Dr. Neiman Marcus over there and uh, Nordstrom's another favorite charity of hers. So <laughs> go, go ahead. Sorry. My wife's going to unplug my computer in a few minutes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> There's a couple more questions here before we let you get all those books back to the library before the library closes. Uh, so the, <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> so the night prior to, a lot, to leaving a long cross country, uh, I always get a little bit anxious no matter how much I prepared. Is that a good thing? There's two types of uh, anxiety. There's emotional anxiety and there's intellectual anxiety. Emotional anxiety, <coughs> excuse me, I should take up coffee and I already have, I'm smoking, I already have the cough. <coughs> excuse me. Intellectual anxiety and motion, emotional anxiety. Intellectual ang emotional anxiety, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize. Mm -hmm. Emotional anxiety is that type of fear that is based on things that naturally scare us, such as loud noises, falling heights, or in my case, uh, I have a fear of making loud noises while I'm falling. 
that is that that's uh, uh, stalling an airplane when you don't expect to stall an airplane, those kind of things. Intellectual anxiety is uh, not the stuff that can immobilize you, but it is the anxiety that actually helps you prepare better for what you're doing. So as long as you feel comfortable in the airplane, that's another way of saying as long as you can predict what the airplane will do, such as you can predict what a, a side slip will do in terms of getting you down on the runway. You can predict that if you got into a, a stall and then spun the airplane, if you, if you uh, pre press the opposite rudder, opposite the direction of rotation, you will stop the rotation as long as the nose is, uh, in this case, and, and recover from the onset of a spin, as long as you decrease the angle of attack. There's nothing in an airplane that's going to hurt you like that that's not predictable then you won't have emotional anxiety. You'll have intellectual anxiety. And in that case, on my website, I have an, a blog article called Pilot Demons. Pilot Demons, P-I-L-O-T-D-E-M-O-N-S. And it talks about how to, in essence, be comfortable with that intellectual anxiety that actually is more of an ally than it is uh, a hindrance. So yes, the answer to your question is yes. And if I may add, when it comes to flying cross country, if you'd like to fly it in a more safe manner, let's say fly it with training wheels or training wings, so to speak, when you go on a cross country flight, don't just head right for the airport you wanna to go to if it's 150 miles away, you can fly it tactically. You can fly from one airport to the next airport, fly over it now, just fly over those airports, knowing, and I know this sounds strange, but some people have actually done this simply to reduce the intellectual anxiety, hopefully not emotional anxiety, that they have on their first country cross-country flight. Anything goes wrong, you land right there. Even if you don't know what the airport is, what the name of it is, you just land right there. You walk up to the guy at the gas pump and say, how do you pronounce the name of this place? And he'll say, Corona. Or he'll say, you're lost, aren't you? In which case, just give it up and uh, confess. <laughs> because at least that's one way to do it. And then after a couple of times like that, and you say, yeah, I can see the airport over there. I'm just heading directly to it, um, to my destination airport. So when way. your question starts off with what state is this, you know you're lost. Sorry. What state is it? What, yeah, what, when, when what? your question starts off with what state are we in, that you, you, you know you're lost. Yeah, exactly. Or why is that ocean there? Yeah, that would be a great one. Or why are those airplanes that don't look anything like me uh, flying next to me at high angles of attack with guns on them? Mm, I, wonder, <laughs> I wonder what that means. So, uh, yeah, scary stuff. Jeremy, your question. Go ahead. Well, uh, Rod, uh, we're uh, getting close to the time we... We advertise to you um, time for one last question uh, and we can go longer if you want. But uh, the one question I would like to ask you is, can you talk to us about an experience where you scared yourself and what you did with the information that you learned from that experience and how you applied it to the future? Yes, I will. And by the way, this is, it's just iced tea. All right. I know it looks like a, I, I don't, I, I don't know telling what kind of webinar you would get if I were to actually do that. Yeah. I love it. Webinar. I would, they would have pulled the plug a long time ago. So um, it's just iced tea. So uh, trust me. And uh, if I have to bring my wife in to authenticate it, then I, I will. Yeah. And I see on the things too, I'm glad some people are, yes, I'm wearing pants. Thank you very much. I got, to, <laughs> got out at that out of the seminar. Okay. Uh, yes. One time I was on approach. I, I've had a couple of times where I've scared myself and I, I was responsible all the time on all occasions. And one time I just didn't see it coming. I was high on final approach in a Cessna 150 by myself. And I thought I would go ahead and just try something a little fancy I know in the Cessna 150, 40 degrees of flaps, you put those flaps down, you can point that nose straight down. It'll come out of the air. You'll never exceed VFE. You'll never exceed the maximum flap extension speed. It is an amazing thing about the 150. But I remember that I was so high that I thought, okay, I'm just going to make a tight 360. And the moment I rolled into a 360 with 40 degrees of flaps and the nose down, I realized that I had entered into one of these tightening descending spirals where you roll in and now the speed increases so quickly uh, even though there's a lot of drag and the airplane nose pitches up and your response is as it pit pitches up to push down a little bit 
but it pitches up and it tightens the bank. And all of a sudden I find myself spinning around. I mean, not a spin, but I was making this descending spiral and I see the runway coming up, excuse me. And at that one moment I thought, you know, I'm not sure I, I can actually pull out in time. And at that moment, I realized what an incredibly silly thing to do. It was, there's just, just absolutely no reason for it. And uh, I did pull out, of course, and it taught me one thing. And let me, if I can read to you from Wyatt Earp's uh, second comment that I didn't, didn't catch this. And I didn't uh, have, actually didn't have room for it till now. It says, the most important, this is from Wyatt Earp in his autobiography. <clears throat> he said, the most important lesson I learned from, uh, uh, I learned from man, from man, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. The most important lesson I learned from those proficient gunfighters gun was that the winner of gunplay usually was the man who took his time. The second was, if I hope to live long on the frontier, I would shun fancy flash trick shooting or grandstand play as I would poison. Does that speak to you? <clears throat> In this case, doing anything fancy uh, that is done without reason and doing it quickly, you know, um, all it does is increases your uh, chance for danger. And that's why, you know, you, you should probably recognize this, Jeremy. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. If that isn't a more power, a powerful aphorism to guide us in an airplane, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Everything I do in an airplane is done under the, uh, uh, under the, uh, the, the imprimatur of that particular phrase. Wonderful. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, things to keep you safe. So any more questions? I'll take a few more. You want to go ahead and with a question, Paul? Um, sure. So um, what is the best practice for uh, visiting unfamiliar airports besides reading the AFM? <clears throat> um, I, you know, it's <laughs> another interesting thing. Sometimes I think we avoid the practical for the conventional. Um, if, if I send a student on a cross-country flight, as an example, he's going to an airport or she's going to an airport they've never been to, there, there's just... And even if the visibility is good, it's better to fly over the airport at the appropriate altitude, the minimum of 500 feet above the traffic pattern altitude, or uh, if you fly into class D airspace uh, uh, above the airport, or get permission, of course, you have to establish communication, and then look at the airport, see what the airport is doing. Uh, and then uh, once you do that, look at the airport, see which way the, you know, the, the wind triangle, the, uh, the wind sock, whatever happens to be a wind indicator there, look for the direction of the pattern, and then fly out, enter the 45, and, which is my recommended uh, uh, pattern entry technique. It's the one that the FAA has recommended for so long. And uh, use that as a method for entering, instead of just trying to figure out how to enter the 45 at an airport you've never been to. That, that can be crazy sometimes. That sometimes when you get a lot of experience, then it's easy to do that. But practically speaking, it's probably not a wise idea for those that you know, don't have those type of perceptual skills. And one other thing, I carry a pair of binoculars when I fly in my flight case, because if you ever needed sort of radar for the eyes, you know, sometimes that really helps being able to do that. And the, one more thing, if you're having trouble finding an airport, uh, take your, make a little hole like this, close this other eye and do this. Put, do that, just like that. And what this does is it cuts out all the surrounding, the peripheral distracting information. And you can just look like this and ah, there it is right there. It's where all those airplanes are. Or if you want to do it in stereo, you can actually do, do that. Passengers don't like that, but, but that is actually a very good technique. That's an old World War II technique. Just, there's so many amazing little things that you can do to keep yourself safe and make it easier for you when you fly. Rod, what's the most uh, interesting experience you've had as an instructor with a student? Oh, soloing a student. And I'll make this my, my last question. I'm probably keeping you guys longer here than I need to. Soloing a student is always a fascinating ex experience for me. I, 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 when you say interesting, um, they're all interesting, but and I do have some rather strange experiences as a flight instructor that I've talked about uh, on many different lectures and programs. But um, 
I remember soloing a student in a Cessna 150 one time. I gave him my pre-solo talk as we're in the run-up area. That's where we used to get out of the airplane. And, and then uh, the air, as the airplane's taxiing away, the aircraft number was November 0000, 000, 000, 000 7. Five letters, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0007. Last three numbers were 0, 0, 007, 007. As he's taxiing away, I'm thinking, 007. Hmm. License to kill. I got to go get this guy. And <laughs> one of those existential moments where maybe that wasn't the best airplane. <laughs> so, okay. It wasn't that bad. But soloing a student is always an amazing thing. Uh, nothing That never got old, as did n n most things with flight instruction never got old with me anyway. But that was gold. That was always fun. You know, listen, before I go, let me say again how much I appreciate being on the show with uh, you, Jeremy, and Paul. Uh, you folks do a, a great job. And anybody that is, and I saw all the comments on Facebook that people were offering uh, to you. And you know what? You, uh, those are pretty nice comments. Uh, you should be very proud of that. Thank so, you. I'm so, very uh, proud. You're I'm doing a happy moment share of safety work here. All right. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your time tonight, Rod. Uh, I appreciate you donating your, your experience and your time for the all well, well being of uh, enhancing aviation safety and general aviation and for what you've contributed to general aviation because it's, it's very impressive. Like I Thank was you, saying in the very beginning, I got my start in aviation, in general aviation. I transitioned over to the military, then flew uh, professionally, but truly my heart is in teaching and I want to give back and I want to make a difference. And that's exactly what you've done. And that's what I want to do in the future. Thank so you. Rod, I can't you thank you enough. enough. And from Paul, we can't thank you enough for, for participating tonight. And, you know, it, this has been amazing. I've been getting nothing but amazing comments on the phone and in the chat uh, for having you here. And, you know, I would love to have you back as a guest in the future. Oh, of you, course. Absolutely. I would, absolutely. I would love to have that. Come and um, I'll give you one last opportunity to say any other remarks before I go to the closing slide. I just want to tell you once again, thanks, Rod. Thank you, folks. Remember, aviation safety is as safe as, uh, well, airplane flying is as safe as you want it to be. It's a matter of choices. It's not a matter of kismet or luck. Fate is not the hunter. And the one thing you want to remember is 30, capital O, capital F, capital F. And, uh, you know, pick up something from my website, rodmachado.com, 30% off, and any digital product or audiobook. And that, uh, that is uh, something I think you might find valuable, and I hope you all fly safe and have a wonderful time. Remember, aviation is one of your fun things. Don't let anybody ruin it for you, and you know, make be a good custodian of your own safety and the people you fly with. Thank you very all much. Right. All right, thanks, Rod. Thanks, Rod. Okay, folks. See you then. All, all right. right, we'll go ahead and close this out tonight, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, viewers who participated on this webcast. We broke a record tonight and we've had people watching on Facebook live. This will be uploaded to YouTube um, within the next few days. And also thank you to Britt Maddox from Center Point Aviation for providing a, a strong internet connection for me tonight uh, to broadcast this webcast. Uh, for those of you who joined in tonight, we had you re uh, re register online and I will automatically be able to give you all uh, wings credit. But for those of you who watched this presentation after the fact, uh, who did not register tonight, punch in 6864 to a, cor correction, 7864 um, to flyallamerican at gmail.com. Um, I want you to follow me if you don't mind on YouTube at All American Aviation. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and also, check out Rod's uh, material on, uh, on his uh, website that he mentioned earlier. And tonight, I, 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 once again, I want to say, finally, thanks. And I'm looking forward to have as many of you back uh, two weeks from tonight on October the 6th at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we're going to talk about go-no-go no, go, no, go weather decisions with guest speaker uh, J.P. Dice, who is a flight instructor and a television news chief meteorologist from Birmingham, Alabama. He will be on 
at 7.30 on October the 6th. The greatest accomplishment is not in never falling, but in rising again after you fall. From Vince Lombardi. Good night, everybody. Fly safe, keep learning, and never give up on a dream. So long. <laughs>